after that, that moment from before and when you drop in, like if you don't have your head in the right space, it's not gonna be good. And there's only like, you know, a couple seconds or minutes before you have, you know, you have to turn that on or off. Mm -hmm. What's going on everyone? I'm Nils Mindnick and this is the Backcountry Podcast, a show aimed towards providing insight on the outdoor industry by chatting with people who work within it. Today we're going to be talking with Lexi DuPont, skier, pilot, and general outdoor enthusiast. Welcome. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm so pumped to be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How um you kind of just kind of recently are in the mix of backcountry <laughs> very recently. Yeah. How's so that? It's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've I've kind of come from the Eddie Bauer for a long time, 15 years with Eddie Bauer. Yeah. Um, which I felt really lucky to be with one brand for a long time, but you know, constantly innovating and changing and switching things up. And yeah. so this is just like a whole new pulse of creativity and inspiration for me to yeah. join this new team. Yeah, yeah. And I was like I was psyched to hear that you were kind of getting in the mix because um we actually first met at a risk maturity course a couple of years ago. Um and it was such a pleasure getting to work with you. That was You're so like good. super chill. So I'm excited. I think I think there's gonna be some really cool things in the pipeline um that I'm looking forward to. Totally. I mean being up there at Bald Face was so fun. I had just gotten the wild card for the free ride world tour. Yeah. And I was like, oh Nils is here. He's like the champion. And yeah. I, I went up and I was asking you some questions. Like I hadn't competed in 10 years. Yeah. And I'm like, what what do I need to do? Like, what is this gonna be like? And you had such great advice. I was like, this guy's rad. <laughs> Yeah, and I was I, I was looking into that. I didn't know that you had previously competed in big mountain skiing, and it kind of seemed to like, you know, earlier on in your ski career, that was maybe one of your kind of like segue breakout moments was getting into competitive big mountain true, skiing. True, yeah. Um, is that true? Yeah, absolutely. I um, started when the Freeride World Tour wasn't quite the World Tour. It was more like the American Tour. Okay. <laughs> Free yeah. skiing tour. Yeah. Um, and that was so fun. And that kind of, I put my foot in the door with, with big mountain skiing. And then after five years of that, transferred into filming. Yeah. Um, and got offered to go on my first Warren Miller trip. And then that snowballed into a lot of different film productions and um, storytelling, which I loved. It was just like going traveling around the world and telling my own story. Yeah. Um, the places I was going, um, a lot of things centered around the environment and women in the mountains. Yeah. And then out of nowhere, I get a WhatsApp text from Free Red World Tour from Lolo. And he's like, do you want to be a wild card? And I was like... I totally canceled the contest out of my repertoire, but why not? Let's go for it. Um, and it, it totally changed my career and my life at that point. Um, segwaying into the event that I started after being on the tour, the Sister Summit. Um, it was a big inspiration for that. So um, it was really fun. And I also met Hedvig Vessel, my business partner and best friend. And we've done everything since last year we've done together so that was really cool that's such like a funny kind of full circle mm -hmm. arc right yeah. like uh just when you thought you were out <laughs> they pulled you back in i kind of I, I know i like i feel like i might have a similar experience um to that is maybe somewhere on my horizon because I, I did the tour for a few seasons and then kind of transitioned back into filming and i feel like it and when it makes sense I could see myself going back, you right. know, and kind of having this like second phase of competitive snowboarding come to fruition. Right. It's pretty fun. Like the, how, uh, how did the second season go? Um, I mean, it was, it was amazing going back into the tour. It was humbling for sure. The, the level of riding was a yeah. whole new level from when I left it. How was that? Cause I know my, like my perspective was skewed since I hadn't had any like previous knowledge of working and operating in the tour and like what was that taking a, a 10 year yeah break? 10 year break I mean just the the terrain selection and the venues they were choosing was at a whole new level and then the skill level of all the athletes it yeah. was like I wasn't me in the past it was like oh I'm just gonna ski how I like to ski I was actually having to step into this whole new competition persona of like how I need to push myself every moment and like yeah. step it up and try things I've never tried before. Yeah. Step out. And but that's the beauty of being a human and then being an athlete is we constantly get to reinvent ourselves. Yeah. And the industry really rewards that creativity when you can um yeah, you think you close a door, 
and it is never closed, no, you know? No, <laughs> it's like, no they're never closed. It's kind yeah. of a revolving door, maybe. That's a revolving door. <laughs> yeah, and we can be everything at once. We don't just have to be a film star or just a competitor or a guide. You know, you could actually be a guide, a competitor, and a film filmer. You could do it all. Can you elaborate on that? Like, I think a lot of people, even in their, myself included, in, you know, your everyday life, it's one or the other. You either feel super uh focused and like narrowed in on one topic right mm -hmm. and nothing else matters or kind of the like ADD aspect of myself I'll just get completely spread too thin mm -hmm. and it seems like especially with a lot of things that you're passionate about we'll, we'll kind of get into the other various pursuits that you're you got going on but how do you is it natural for you to kind of have a lot going on at once and ju juggle a bunch of things? Yeah. Or is it just like, is that a, been a learned skill? Yeah, I mean, I think that's been my turn, at, turn on from a young age. And maybe my parents contributed to that. It was like when I was growing up after school, I'd have violin practice, horseback riding, ski team, soccer. Like I was doing all the sports at once. Yeah. Um, and I've talked to other athletes. They're like, no, I had to tap into one thing that I loved. Yeah. And I'm like, I kind of love having... I think the greatest school we, um, skill we can have as humans is as many tools in our work belt. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. we can pull on anything. Um, and yeah, it does come with, a, a, there's a fine line of getting overrun and spread too thin and reaching that exhaustion point. Yeah. But if you're staying in that mindset of creativity and curiosity, um, I think that's where I, my energy is fueled is yeah. the curiosity point curiosity. of like, what if I did that? And what if it was better than I ever imagined? Hmm. Do you feel like your parents kind of helped you cultivate that and like having grown up in a mountain town and have that outdoors exposure absolutely i mean people will be like so what what are your sports and i'll give them like a list of 10 and they're like that's impossible and i'm like, <laughs> I'm like what no. are they Hit me with but something. i'm like I'm, I'm a mountain woman like mountain women are renaissance women we contain multitudes and we can do all of it so for me, like my, my biggest focus is skiing, um, but now surfing has taken a huge role in my life. And I actually this year took two weeks off in the middle of the winter and went to Australia and went surfing. And I'd never left the snow in my whole life. And it was this awesome recharge, right? Like we flew from Japan to Australia for a surf trip and wow. came back just like supercharged for the winter again. Um, and another one, like in the summer, I fly airplanes and it's really fun because I get to check out the mountains that I want to ski in the winter, but it also allows this access to these remote areas in the mountains where I can go mountain biking or camping or fly fishing. And it's, it's really mother nature is my inspiration and whatever I can do, whatever activity allows me to tap in closer to her is I'm going to do it, you know, huh. and I'm going to try it. Crazy. How did, <laughs> I kind of want to like back that up too, because I was seeing, um, you know, it seems like you have a really good job at finding, you know, these skill based oriented, uh, sports and activities and thoroughly pursuing them to mm -hmm. a, a high level and like a passionate, um, ability. And I was kind of curious, I was doing some homework and I saw that earlier on, it wasn't like you made a direct, uh, evolution of just skiing and mountain time. You have spent a lot of time in the, in the water and the ocean and the big ocean and <laughs> from Sun Valley to large scale sailing trips. What, like, how is my, my I'm just how <laughs> yeah, for starters. It's true. Um, so I was lucky enough growing up, we had a house in Cape Cod, um, in the summertime. So as soon as the school year was over, we were headed to the beach um, and my family was big sailors. My uncle Lexi um, was a, a, a navigator on four America's Cup campaigns. And so he was like our, our sailing instructor, our, our coach. And so all summer long, we're just going along Cape Cod to all these different towns and racing sailboats. So I actually had a full ride scholarship to Endicott College for sailing for their sailing team. And we're racing on the Charles against like Boston College and Harvard and Tufts and um, and I loved it. It was such a rad experience. But after that first year, I was like, wow, I really miss skiing. Yeah. So transferred to University of Colorado in Boulder. And my dear friend, McKenna Peterson, who is also a pro skier, she's like, Lex, you should try this free skiing world tour. 
went to Telluride, I had no idea what I was doing. Like I grew up mm -hmm. racing. Okay. And so yeah. my mom, she was a freestyle skier and she goes, Lex, you got to go up to the judges and introduce yourself. So I go up to them and she had me wear her old like seventies mogul pants. They were bright pink with stars down the sides and like the orange circles on the knees so that they could notice me. <laughs> and I went down, I ended up podiuming my first contest with like the big check. You yeah. Know? And oh, I was yeah. like, okay, this is so <laughs> fun. Like this is it. And like, that was my new path. But it makes me think, what if I had stayed in Boston and sailed? You know, like, yeah. I would not be down this path I am now as a professional skier. But I still love it. I'm so passionate about sailing for sure. Are you, do you still sail actively? Um, we have some little dinghies up on the lake in Idaho. We no longer have our property in Cape Cod. Um, but then my family, both my parents are uh, captains of sailboats. So for some family vacations, we'll do like bare boat charters through the BVIs and me and my sisters are the crew and my parents are the captains and we kind of <laughs> island hop around. How's and, that dynamic? Oh, there's a lot of yelling. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot of yelling for sure. Oh <laughs> like that was God. not a relaxing vacation. No, I was just like, <laughs> pull in the sails. Yeah. <laughs> Drop the anchor. You stop yelling at me. And didn't you? You did a semester at <laughs> at sea. Yeah. What is that? Oh my gosh, so special. So when I was going to University of Colorado, I wanted to study abroad. Um, and there's semester at sea through the University of Virginia. And we circumnavigated the, the globe in three months. Um, and a really lucky part of that was Archbishop Desmond Tutu was a professor on our ship. Okay. So, I mean, learning from him, going to lectures with Archie, he wanted us to call him, um, learning about compassion and globalization um, was so impactful on my life. Crazy. Sure. How old were you at that time? That was my junior year in college. This is like such like a, yeah. a formative phase, especially totally. to have like something that influential, monumental take place. Totally. And I remember that was the same year that I had, I was in my first Warren Miller film. Whoa. So um, my sponsors actually paid for me to get off the boat in China and fly back to Boulder for the premiere. And I went to my first film premiere and then flew back to China and met back up with the boat. Whoa. And um, and then I brought the DVD with me and did a premiere on the ship for all the other students. Crazy. And so cool. How big is the, like how big and how many people are on the boat? 700 students on the boat. Whoa. Yeah. Is it like huge. a sailboat? No, it is a, it's like a motor. A... It was a big like motor yacht. Yeah. So we weren't actually sailing, but we were yeah. doing, you know, the big ocean crossings. Yeah, totally. So when you're doing the ocean crossings, you're that's your study time. You're like in in class huh. and then when you pour it at these different countries you have anywhere from like four to seven days to explore and pursue like they give you different subjects that you have to write papers on and um, do research while you're in each country Crazy. and then you're kind of connecting the dots about the globalization yeah. as the theme of of the whole semester that sounds it was so really cool. crazy yeah was there any kind of like scary moments at sea or anything like that or was um, it feel like pretty casual the whole time we're like yeah we're Got a killer boat. Things running tip top. Like, oh, I, I, mean, I feel like every we're... sea story has this like, <laughs> the air intake got flooded and we were taking on water. Like, I mean, for finals, we're studying, we're crossing from Japan to Hawaii and we had to study for finals and it was a nine day crossing through some really rough seas. And <laughs> I've never seen people's skin actually turn that color green, like, like, like physically ill. And it was so wavy. They made us stay in our rooms. We couldn't leave our rooms for like three days um, because it was dangerous to move around the ship. And there was a lot of puking. And uh, <laughs> Jeez, part. how'd you fare? I did all right. It was the first time actually I've been seasick because you you're like trying to read and study in these heavy seas. Mm -hmm. You're like, that's not going to happen. Like, can I get an audio book, please? Jeez. <laughs> Jeez. Oh my God, that's crazy. Oh. Do you ever think you would um, try to get back into like distance sailing or distance oh for like sure ship stuff maybe just like around the world on. yeah around or around the world journey is definitely my future it's on the hit list yeah i'd like to do it once i have children and can share that with oh. my little ninos and niñas yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. how is like i mean it almost seems kind of full circle too that you started out skiing and then on the off seasons sailing yeah. you know you're sailing and spending time in the ocean and the water and there's you kind of have this ever compounding like aspect of adventure and like it's refreshing and like these um non-traditional outlets i would say For sure. um and then you've kind of found yourself back to surfing yeah i mean they balance each other really well yeah how so i mean you go from just these gravity intense sports right um like i was just spent a month in alaska 
and my nervous system was tapped after, as one's is after a month in Alaska. I mean, you're not even really resting because you never know when it's going to go blue and you're going to have to go stand on top of the gnarliest peak of your life. Um, and so from there, I call it re-entry season, where I every year for the last 15 years, I've gone straight to Mexico really? <laughs> from Alaska. Yeah. And I kind of just turn off my phone and I get in the ocean and I just catch waves. And um, and it just chills my nervous system huh. to the point where I'm actually able to function and come back to society. Because yeah. I find a lot of times it's hard for people to relate what we to what we do in Alaska, um, those big mountains. And so it's kind of a digestion period hmm. for me to understand like what I went through that winter and, you know, what, what worked, what didn't, what was I proud of, what scared the shit out of me and how can I move forward? And I find the ocean is like my biggest, um, soother. Interesting. <laughs> it's like my, my, my cozy blankie or my pacifier yeah, to totally. relax. <laughs> I know a friend. Yeah. I have a friend that kind of like, he surfs a lot and also spends time filming all winter and like his understanding of, uh balancing the two is that you know it's like the the mountains are his father and like the oceans his mother and one's this like kind of you know the mountains like harden you in a way that's different than a lot of other aspects of the world and i feel like the ocean especially yeah you can have like hard gnarly times but at least my experiences and it sounds like your current pursuit Mm -hmm. in the ocean is a much like softer relaxing like you're in the water right you're kind of like floating around and like bobbing on a surfboard and like absolutely uh, but and decompressing this, and like opening up mm-hmm. right and at the same time I think it, it still has this like I have this drive what when I'm doing things to be really good at it or to like push myself okay and so with surfing um you know I've been surfing for a long time but I'm still learning a lot every time I go out Um, and so having that mental motivation to want to get in the water and do better and learn keeps my drive going while also having that mother aspect or that relaxing opening at the same time. Mm -hmm. My body really thanks me. Like I really feel it deep in my core, like just being in the ocean. I know. It's healing. It's so healing. I always like, I, uh, I grew up surfing from like a fairly earlier age and our family um kind of similar aspect we lived in vermont in the winter times then we would had a, a house in new jersey and we'd go there in the summer and kind of got introduced to surfing i don't even remember learning mm-hmm. um I surfed a lot until i was like 12 or something and it wasn't until uh probably like my later 20s that i, I got like re-entered into it and like i started doing it again and i had taken a long period off and um I've just opened a complete can of worms because, you know, living in Utah, you don't have readily accessible waves. So then now I'm just like, ah, man, this is exactly what I thought would happen where I'm just like, what's the next trip? Where can we go? Like, how do I get back into it? And it's, I think it's totally has something to do with that. Like it is so similar, but it's recharging in these completely opposite ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's the negative ions too of the ocean. You want to elaborate on that? (laughs) I mean, I, so my partner um, is, uh, he's a surfer. He's like the ocean, I'm the mountains. And yeah. um, he's also um, a physician. And he's really taught me about, you know, breath work by the ocean and the, the negative ions that you receive from the ocean and the scientific benefits of that. It, it's pretty wild what it does for our nervous system, our sympathetic nervous system. What does it do? I mean, it just completely opens up and relaxes huh. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, from going from that restriction, I mean, just even thinking about the, all the clothes we wear in the winter versus just having your skin to the elements by the ocean. Um, and then the negative ions is just like kind of what happens when there's a fresh rain or there's lightning. It's kind of there's ozone there, which is like heavy, heavy antimicrobial, um, antiviral, has crazy benefits, anti-inflammation. Um, and that's a big reason why we were drawn to it and feel love it so much. Dang, that's great. I did not know that. That's a lot. <laughs> right, so when I heard the science This is really going to help me sell some right? surf trips to my partner. It's going to be good. <laughs> After I heard that, I was like, oh, there's actually scientific benefits that I was I was feeling something, I but guess you I, just proved it. I guess I got to go now. <laughs> got to go. <laughs> More beach time. Yeah. I, I'm curious. I saw you did some stuff with Laird Hamilton, mm. speaking of like water and conditioning and yeah. 
Um, I was like kind of familiar with what was going on, but I've heard that that guy's got like oh my gosh a crazy conditioning <laughs> program. What was that all about? Yeah, so he's he's just um, a big he's deeply curious about the body and maximizing hmm. our our life expectancy, and he's constantly learning things and trying new things. So it's like you know, for years I was doing CrossFit for like fifteen years, and it was one kind of way of working out. And then tapping into Gabby and Lance's program, which is um, not many weights, a lot more body mu- movements and um, less like big heavy weights. You know, we'll use some small weights. But mm-hmm. um, and so in the fall, you know, we go to Hawaii and we were on their program, which was workouts in the morning, um, which are anywhere like, like an hour and a half. And then you do the ice bath sauna routine and then you go out and you surf um, all afternoon and then you come back in the evening and you do another one. So it's two a days, five days a week. Um, and I was thinking like, oh, we're not doing like big, heavy back squats and like overhead presses. Like, am I going to be strong enough for the winter? Mm-hmm. And my biggest test is like I get to Revelstoke and I see if I can just rip top to bottom without stopping on, you know, day one. And I was like, wow, it worked. Like I am feeling fit. Crazy. And I had more energy and like zero injury going into it. Yeah. Um, so I'm like a full believer. And then that's also accompanied with the diet, which yeah. I think is so re- re- um, readily available in Hawaii um, with all the fruits, veggies and fish. Um, just eating really clean, sleeping really well. Um, but the, the sauna ice bath is now something that we've taken everywhere with us. Yeah. Um, I fully drank the Kool-Aid on that one. It works. Um, What's up with that? You got so, some, can you say words like sympathetic nervous system? Or <laughs> what do you got for me? Well, it's it's uh, heat shock shock proteins. <laughs> is so you get Nailed into that. Yeah, you get into the ice bath, and it's a three minute ice bath, and then you go into the sauna for ten minutes, and so you're getting those heat shock proteins from the sauna, and that thing's blasting. And then you go back and do another three minutes in the ice bath. Instead of rewarming after the ice bath, you just kind of let your body rewarm which is nice to do in Hawaii. I mean, if you do that in Revelstoke, you're going to be shivering all day. Um, but in Hawaii, the sun, um, and also after the ice bath, apparently, this is what we're learning, is all of our um, blood cells are opened. So then you get into the sun and you're getting full vitamin D absorption, hmm. um, more so than you would just going from like the ocean into the sun, but like yeah. freezing your ass off and then getting in the sun is yeah. more vitamin D. Yeah. Um, and so now we've got an infrared sauna up in Revelstoke, which helps our valley bottom blues, as they call it, up in Canada when you haven't seen the sun in three I'm familiar. months. Yeah, yeah, I am familiar. Yeah, so the infrared, <laughs> and then we actually just purchased um, the biggest Yeti cooler you can buy. Like they're the like, ten. They're like or huge. Something. Yeah, it's like yeah. six feet long. Yeah. And so we have that in the garage. We filled it with ice, um, and we have an ozone purifier. So you're getting the benefits of the ozone machine, which is that negative ions. Um, and it's cleaning it. So you're not having to like drain the tub every time. Yeah. Um, it's a great Yeti ad as well. When you get all the homies over <laughs> in the Yeti cooler, <laughs> all the benefits. Available on backcountry.com. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. I mean, have you always had, so I do like hot, cold therapy. Mm-hmm. I'm like been big on saunas and yeah. kind of. If I can like convince myself, I'll like do a sauna and then end with like a cold shower. And that's yeah. my like best effort at it. I'm, I can't do like the Huberman three minutes in the morning cold shower. I just, I'm not there yeah. right now. Uh, you can practice <laughs> but, it, yeah. But like, I figured something's better than nothing. And especially, it's funny, like, and I want to get your perspective on this. Because I feel like especially from the sounds of it, it's gotten very refined. But even the last, I feel like every five years, I kind of like read define and design and iterate my um conditioning process and and then also my um approach so my whatever my preparation and my execution Mm -hmm. kind of just seems to keep getting like a little bit better has that always been the case for you yeah agreed i mean doing the same uh, movements all the time like if someone's like this is my workout and i do the same movements all the time Instead of these like functional movements of actually, you know, combining it with some yoga or like doing squats while you're walking and going forward and backward instead of just sitting there and bench pressing or like back squats over and over. Like Mm -hmm. what are we in the mountains? Are we ever just doing the same thing over and over again? No, we're constantly like hitting different cliffs, airs, different bumps and mountains Mm -hmm. and reading the terrain and our bodies have to react. So like constantly redefining our training to match what we're doing in nature 
is so important. And I just love how right now so many people are researching this and coming yeah. up with new ways. And I'm like, I'll try it all. Yeah. And if it's going to work, like, hey, let's keep doing that. Yeah. If it's not working, all right, next, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, but it's, a, it's really cool that there's a lot of research and practice going into it. Was that, was like your childhood kind of like that a lot? Like are your parents like that Yeah, as they're, well? they're, they're very active. My dad's like Pilates guy for sure. Um, my mom. Pilates mom, guy. Yeah, he just, you he don't does see a lot that of, as much. I feel like you see Pilates mom. <laughs> yeah, often. Pilates dad. He <laughs> is. He realized he couldn't tie his shoes when we were in high school and he's like, something's got to change. <laughs> so he started doing Pilates and now he's like, he was skiing in AK with us last year and he's seven, in his seventies. So like pretty cool. Whoa, cool. Yeah. And, um. What, I was kind of like saw something about your mom. She was like a mogul. Yeah, she's skier. first first woman to do backflip on skis. Yeah, that's yeah, what it was. Air horn for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> what? So like, did it ever feel like there was like pressure from them to also turn into like an elite skier, or did it was it like I if I had to guess, it was maybe like a pretty natural. Yeah, it was pretty process. natural. I mean, it, it more just showed like showed me there was a path and that could be an option. Hmm. You know, like being a pro skier, I grew up with these photos of my mom just laying out big back flips with a high ponytail over Lake Tahoe. <laughs> and I was like, oh wait, I could maybe do that, you know? So it just opened my horizon in my mind to seeing that as an option. You know, I have two sisters and they're not professional skiers. They love skiing. It's mm -hmm. what we all do as a family, but they've been drawn in other directions with their career path. Um, it was never like shoved down my throat or forced, you know? That's cool. It was more like, if you're going to sign up for something, you're going to finish it. There's yeah. no like, okay, quit in the middle of the soccer season or ski season because yeah. you don't like it and you're tired. Yeah. It's like, no, you got to finish it. And I think that was the best lesson Lesson was yeah. like, start, finish what you start. Kind of like, a, yeah, know what you're signing up for and yeah. just like see it through. See it and through. it's like, okay, to to suffer a little bit right. or a lot. and Or say no like, next year when you're like, okay, skiing, not next year, but you always have the summer and you come back and you're like, ski team again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. How do you feel like... I mean, because you're doing so many different activities, right? You're you've gotten into surfing, you you're skier, you're sounds you know. I, we'll get into the the flying thing in a moment, but where where do you think you get that like motivation and drive to keep finding or pursuing or like perfecting all these different traits? I think it's it's curiosity, and it's also just like one of the coolest things humans can do is learn. And I'm fully turned on by learning new things and it's seeing what I'm capable of. And yeah, I fail. I fail a lot and I try hard and I fail. Um, but if we don't try and we fail, like those are my greatest lessons are when I'm struggling. Why, my, do you think like, you like, why do you think you like learning so much? <sighs> Maybe because it, it was really hard for me as a kid. Like I had grew up with a learning disability and had a lot of help in school to like make it through and I was told that I couldn't do things and I really just wanted to prove people wrong. Yeah. And so I think that was like the the ignite that ignited the flame at a young age of wanting yeah. to prove people wrong. You kind of get that like I oh, really watch that, this. That, that, that like <laughs> dopamine rush or something too, right? When you like suck at something so much it seems so unrealistic and then all of a sudden maybe people support you, maybe people don't along the way, but none of that really matters because eventually you accomplish the task mm -hmm. right and you're like wow I, that felt good oh good you know? yeah I I don't know I relate so much to that I feel like all I do is fail yeah. I like everything I do is like I'm like I'm a good snowboarder right like I'm a career snowboarder right and that's fine and dandy but pretty much everything else in my life like you know my my like passions are climbing Mm -hmm. and climbing has also been this 10, you know, like going on 10 or 12 year journey at this point where I'm just like, technically I'm like, I've gotten better obviously as, as anyone would, but I'm still just like, definitely not a pro mm -hmm. by any means. And like kind of seeing just how much work that takes and seeing the like 10 year arc mm -hmm. of progress. Oh, yeah, it's I'm pretty wild. Back. Yeah. Trying hard and failing and then once it does work out and you look back at how hard it was to get to where you are, yeah, it like kind of moves you forward. Yeah. And I feel like, I don't know, this will be a good perspective on your end because it seems like so often in especially snowboard culture and I would imagine ski culture and a lot of like action sport culture, the, um, the reward happens really quickly. You know, like you'll go to a face and you'll be like, 
all right, well, we'll take about 30 seconds or a minute to get down the face and I will have like accomplished the goal. Like you did your task within 30 seconds or something, you know, and then like maybe you fall and you go back and do it again. But like odds are within a day you have like your goal and you do it, mm -hmm. you know, climbing's kind of, for me, climbing's interesting because it's just like, I, there's some climbs I've been trying for years now and it's taught me this like whole other realm of patience that I then like compound into snowboarding or life or other things and I think it's like all these sports kind of feed off each other in a way for sure yeah right? no I totally I totally believe that um I I have this mantra sometimes of like friction creates fire and then fire perpetuates you forward um so when you're having those hard moments and creating that lot of friction and it's like gosh this sucks I keep failing but like without that friction there is no spark for the fire yeah and that um the like, oh no, you can't do that, or it's too hard, really ignites my competition mindset of watch this. Yeah. Um, and like you're saying, you go up there for one day, you you have kind of an instant gratification of like, yeah. even if you, that 30 seconds you crash one line, by the end of the day, you're gonna get a clip, you know? Yeah. And um, so you get that instant gratification, which is really, <laughs> like it gives you a lot of momentum yeah um, totally but then you do have those longer ones where like for my pilot's license for example was like years of hard work yeah and not really seeing the results but then knowing like okay if I were to start skiing like when I was starting skiing when I was younger I never would have thought I would be where I am now so if I put the time in I know I'll have results mm -hmm. do you feel like I mean and with the piloting thing as well do you feel like uh how, how did that come about? Because from my perspective and talking to you, it's almost like maybe filling a passion or void of sailing because it almost seems like the, a, a style of sailing, mm -hmm. but in like a mountain uh, yeah. venue, you know, like how did that come about? Yeah, it's definitely part of that. I think it's also fed by my family. Like sailing was fed by my family. Skiing was and flying is too. Like oh, so they're flyers as well. Yeah, my dad was a pilot. We grew up. Like he had this this 180 with two seats in the back and me and my sisters would just pile in and that's what we did as a family and beyond that like my grandparents my aunts my uncles it's a huge aviation family huh. um yeah my aunts were the first female team to fly across america what? <laughs> really? my aunt alice was the first to fly the amazon um my uncle richard invented the glider uh, my grandpa like helped put together the first helicopter. It's like aviation to the core. Whoa. And so I'd hear these stories and I have 30 cousins my age. Okay. None of them fly. Like it didn't huh. pass on. It like missed a generation. And I was like, what is wrong with these people? Like we, it's in our blood, you know, like we got to do it. So, um, yeah, I, I, after school, like I love learning, like I said. So after college, I was like, what's next? All right, let's go to flight school and constantly just want to keep learning. And I think our brains are kind of, they're a muscle. And the more we use them, the smarter we get. And so I find when I, you know, I do grind for four months with aviation, like I come out of that so sharp, my brain is just taking and on fire, like all neurons are connecting. And I go into the ski season just like with so much confidence. Um, so it's linked there, but that is kind of this awesome, I mean, flying is multitasking to the next level. You have to constantly be on, you're like thinking about weather, communication, um, the avionics, the engineering, like all of the, the mechanicals of the plane. You're operating nine instruments at once um, while looking outside at terrain and hazards and weather and communicating with other people. Um, Slight parallel to mountain skiing, maybe, <laughs> perhaps. Just kind of just going to take a wild stab in the dark there. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's really similar to like when you're skiing up in Alaska. Like, there's a lot of multitasking happening. Um, uh, but I mean, when you're skiing, you're not really thinking about the people below you as you are when you're flying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's like yeah. some more uh, the inherent risks and maybe like, um, I suppose your liabilities of flying are a bit different risk tolerance plays into it for yeah sure. yeah um but then the multitasking and just the the betterment of myself through flying yeah it's been really awesome um, an exploration you know yeah. like in idaho we have more charted runways than anywhere else in the united states um and a majority of them are backcountry dirt strips along the salmon river uh, so pilots come from all over the world to fly in idaho in the summer and i'm like damn this is in the backyard you know 
Um, so, and flying around those, those runways and mountains with my dad growing up, I was like, Ooh, I want to land here someday. And so it's just been a really wonderful place in the summer to have another high adrenaline activity. <laughs> <laughs> high adrenaline, you know, you're high attentive. Hey, yeah, there we yes. go. Yeah, yeah, you're just attentive. really focused. You're really focused. I feel like that's, that's I love being my, like, focused. Yeah, yeah. That's like, <laughs> people tell me that like, I've, whatever, talked to someone and they'll be like, oh, so you're like an adrenaline junkie. And it's like, well, I just... I was focused. Was really, they're like, how crazy was that jump that you hit? That was like probably such a rush. And I was like, I was pretty focused. You know? <laughs> but the one, the one I get is like, oh, you're not scared of anything, Lexi. I hate the fear oh, one. Oh my God. And I'm like, one. you know what? I'm scared of a lot. And Let's I'm get into that. All right. Yeah. What is, what is fear to you? I'm scared of a lot of things and I'm scared often. Um, and I, but I love it. And I have, I've befriended fear. You know, I think um, our relationship with fear can be practiced Um, As we know, you know, when you were younger, you were like, oh, this three foot air is so scary. And then you stomp it and you're like, okay, stepping it up. Let's go six feet. And then it just keeps progressing. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I'm scared all the time. Like who, if you're not scared standing on top of an Alaskan peak, like something's wrong. You should probably shouldn't be there. Like there's, but there's a balance, right? Like I'm able to harness that fear into confidence and like energy. Like I was talking about the friction and the fire. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't let it paralyze me. Like people often do. They're like, I'm so scared. I can't do it. Yeah. It's like, no, take that energy into charge up to send. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I feel like, and I'm sure it's different for everyone, but you know, for myself, I've spent time and I like discussing the topic of fear because you know, the, like a civilian's perspective of, uh, big mountain skiing in Alaska, for example, We're is crazy. is like oh they're crazy, and like that's not really any different than maybe like someone on Jackass, right? And like they're and, and granted, I don't I haven't interviewed someone from Jackass, right? so I don't know what their mindset is. But I would say for like big mountain skiing and riding, there's just you have so many tools in your toolbox and so much um, like physical and but most mostly like emotional and like psychological mileage. Mm-hmm. Um, to give you this um, platform to make decisions on. Mm -hmm. And there's just this ever ending like, okay, I'm afraid and there's fear because there is risk for pain, injury, bad things. Mm -hmm. Um, Pretty obvious connection. What you do after that, I think is like- The gold. The kind of the gold, because how my understanding of it is like, fear is totally cool. Great thing to have. You should always kind of be afraid, especially in those scenarios. It's when fear turns into panic is when shit hits the fan. Yeah, you shouldn't be there. No. <laughs> <laughs> and like that uh, that mindset, like, is that something that came naturally to you? Or do you feel like it's just all of a sudden you've like reflected on 10 years of skiing? And you're like, oh, I've been doing this all along. Yeah, I mean, it's practice. But I mean, for example, this year was my 15th season in Haynes and I still was scared, you know, like I'd wake up, not sleeping well, waking up and having to like tap into the tools that I have of breath work or like I have these two mantras, um, abundance and confidence. And um, I was actually working with a sports psychologist that helped me with this before going on the tour again. And she teaches us to like do these hip circles at the top of a line. We close our eyes. There's a bunch of other girls doing this right now. And we just really harness into these two mantras, these two words that we have. And we've practiced months and months doing this with our feet on the still earth, you know, in our bedrooms. Um, And also identifying what that person looks like. So like whether it's just like a flaming phoenix with wings that come out of her back or like this big, huge dragon that you're circling in in your hips. Um, and then when the fear steps in, it's usually this inner voice telling me like, you're going to crash, you're going to fall. Like, why are you here? I take her and I like wrap her up in this beautiful purple sparkly cloak. And I just kick her down the mountain (laughs) and you'll see me like literally like kick my ski and roll (laughs) this fear based mindset down the mountain and then circle into my hips into this confident moment. Because after that, that moment from before and when you drop in. Like if you don't have your head in the right space, it's not going to be good. And there's only like, you know, a couple seconds or minutes before you have, you know, you have to turn that on or off. Mm -hmm. Um, And then once you drop in, it's all practice and reaction and and reminding myself, like I've done, I've been here before. I've done this a lot. I have the history and like, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So get rid of the doubt, you know? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, totally. (laughs) That's a very like, uh, 
powerful way you know, to yeah. look at it, but it kind of helps to have such um, an intentful process because then I think, you know, it allows you to like get more consistent results instead mm -hmm. of being like, man, how was I so good that one time, that one day? And you just can't connect the dots, but right. creating like a, an infrastructure to like help you make those decisions. I feel mm -hmm. I'm like, fear was always my like crippling thing riding. I was just like a head case. It wasn't like I would struggle to land or learn the trick or do anything. It was just like, if I could commit to it in the first place, that was my hurdle. Right. Totally. I think like every athlete's journey and every individual's journey is kind of different with that process, but it's interesting what you said about kind of trusting yourself because that was something that I finally, and I don't have as colorful of a, a journey when I'm in a scary situation <laughs> but maybe i should it sounds kind of sick it is. i mean it was when she gave me those tools i'm like damn girl like that Fire is fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like practicing it you know when your feet are on the ground mm -hmm. then when it comes so naturally up there yeah i still get scared and and then you know when i was mentoring hedvig this year up there it was give you know passing those tools on and then working up throughout the day like we do a warm up run. It's really nice to do a warm up run and get feel the snow and then mm -hmm. like build that confidence mm -hmm. to step keep stepping it up throughout the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so important. I know the the warm up is something that I have I had to learn I implemented into my snowboarding later on and like how important it is because like everything else i mean I, I don't know i'm not sure like when i was in school i'm not sure if there's ever much of i wouldn't do like a warm-up math problem but like you know climbing especially or anytime at the gym and like even surfing you know you have to like paddle out that's kind of a warm-up you right. know like um you always just have these like baby steps to take mm -hmm. before you're actually like at the task yeah for sure they're important yeah don't, super over, important. don't overlook the warm-up yeah don't overlook the warm-up <laughs> Oh man. How about I, you know, you, when we first met, you had a pretty funny story about, um, a learning curve you had flying. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could enlighten us with that because I mean, the story is cool, but I also feel like the style of flying you kind of got into is this like, in my mind, it's like the equivalent of like, you know, going into AK to ski or something, you know, you're talking about like dirt tarmacs on the side of rivers and whatnot. That's not necessarily like a, uh, a huge mile long runway in Delaware, right? <laughs> Your margin for error and precision is pretty different. Um, yeah. But yeah. Tell me about this story. Oh man. Okay. So I've got a, I feel like which one are you talking about, but I think I know I think which one. I prop one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. So. I, <laughs> if you're okay telling yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. I can not tell any now. Like, no, okay. Can, cool. The, the legal um, <laughs> papers have been signed. <laughs> the FFAA is, you know, we're not getting sued here. So <laughs> basically what happened was I went up with my instructor in my dad's plane which is this awesome vintage 182 tail dragger and I'm, I'm working on my tail dragger endorsement which is a ridiculous amount of hours so we get up there and it's a really cold day and we land and we're just on rollout and I'm like all right flight's over pretty much and what had happened was the tail wheel um, it was it was like minus 40 that day up high and so the oil and the tail wheel got really sticky and the tail wheel just locked up and we start drifting off the runway and so I'm pushing like hard left rudder to get it back on and then my, my instructor's with me at the time and he goes I have controls we do like a proper pass of controls and he powers back up to try and get it back on the runway because we're drifting off into the dirt and as he powers up we just ground loop which is basically with tail wheels, it, we describe it as like when you're pushing a shopping cart down um, an aisle in the grocery store and it just spins, you know, down the aisle. That's what tail wheels like to do. So it just spins and like our right, I just look outside and the right wing is just hitting the runway and there's dirt flying up and we just fully like, we close the runway down. Um, I have my friends are driving south this is at the Haley airport. They're like calling. They're like, your dad's plane's like backwards and off the runway. Like, is he okay? And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Fall closed down, fire trucks come out, the whole thing. Like we had basically the, fir the front landing gears had like bent underneath. And yeah, we had a full wing strike. Luckily the prop didn't strike. Otherwise the whole engine would have been 
Cause. Totaled. Yeah, completely totaled. Um, but yeah, I was like, that was a really scary moment for me, more of like emotional one from my dad's plane, mm -hmm. but also just like when I talk to now like really experienced bush tail wheel pilots, they're like, we all do it once. Like, good thing you got out of the way. Crazy. I'm like, well, it was <laughs> shitty that it was on concrete, not grass. Cause yeah. like the plane's pretty messed up, but luckily insurance covered all of it. Cool. Um, and, and then my dad was like, oh, pilot air. He was like, didn't believe that the tail wheel got locked up. Classic dad. And he and takes my it My plane's up. great. My yeah, plane's yeah. fine. <laughs> uh-uh. That's, that's on you. <laughs> yeah, so he takes it up to Smiley Creek and like same thing happens to him. Like he, he didn't hit a wing strike or anything and it just tail looped. But he was like, you're right. Something's wrong with our tail he wheel. He flew it afterwards. I'm like, dad, <laughs> Dude, dad, I, I told you. <laughs> Yeah, oh my so that God. one was really humbling, um, and we need those humbling moments, I think, for sure. You know, yeah. you, you just like check yourself. Little reminders. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's for that crazy. learning curve. I would have I probably wouldn't have kept flying. After yeah, that. it's I think, I I think what like... was encouraging was to hear from like the the old cop cotton top pilots that were like all done at once. Yeah. I'm like, well, at least I got that one out of the way. But um, <laughs> yeah, there's still. I think the biggest thing with flying is you have to fly a lot, and that's somewhere right now. Like, I'm trying to find the balance with skiing. I, I go up in the winter, and I'll go like three or four months without flying because I'm so focused on snow. Mm -hmm. Um, and so f trying to figure out a way to get in the sky, you know, every couple of weeks would be really crucial for me. Yeah, so I'm going to navigate that one. <laughs> Jeez. Well, you know, we've been kind of covering a lot of intense topics, you know, <laughs> mountain stuff, sailing across the world, kind of these like uh, confident building, high focus points. But we share a common thread <laughs> with a way we really like to decompress. And I was, I was just curious, what do you think is the best dog breed <laughs> and why is it the English Springer Spaniel? <laughs> Well, the, the best dog breed is definitely the English Springer Spaniel, <laughs> as we both know. Oh my God, I love my dog. Her name is Mezcal. And what's your dog's name? Lucy. Lucy. Yeah, yeah. Lucy. and they both, they're similar coloring too. They're both yeah. like this, they're so cute. Yeah. Um, Mezzy's been so wonderful. She's a really good travel dog. She mm. drove up to Alaska with us this spring, which was mm -hmm. so fun to have her. Um, we also, we take her to Hawaii every fall oh, cool. on the plane. We've just, we got this psychiatric service dog card for her. So yeah. she just like sits under our feet yeah. on the plane. Um, and yeah, they're the best. I mean, so much energy. Did you grow up sure. with dogs? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Always yeah. had them. Uh, always had did them. Did your family, was it, has this been your first Spaniel? First, well, we had them growing up for sure. I feel like when you talk to Spaniel people, they like had, their parents had them yeah. or like they had them growing up. How about you? Yeah. My, uh, my wife had one when she was a kid or I think she like had just left for college and her parents got a Springer Spaniel. And she like completely fell in love with Louie and I've met Louie. He's the man. He's awesome. And then we got Lucy. And yeah. So like, good. They're so soft. They're so soft. It's <laughs> like a nice, I don't know. I feel like there's something to be said about, yeah, dog or like any type of animal companion to like help you kind of decompress. Well, and like, they love the mountains. Like they can go on oh, the yeah. majority of the adventures. She with goes us. everywhere with us. She yeah. comes out climbing. She goes biking. She like super swimming. active. Yeah. They're not lazy dogs. They're no. the very opposite of that. No. <laughs> Oh, the best. Oh. That's awesome. Well, you know, on the on the task of finding places to decompress and maybe spaces for relaxation, what um what's your kind of horizon looking like right now? What do you got planned for the summer and what's like what's sort of the future looking like for Lexi? Yeah, thanks. Um I mean I just came off of a two weeks in Mexico, arrived here this last night, which was really nice. Um, but yeah, I got engaged this, this February. Congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. So we've got a fun, uh, like stag stag I get party down the green and Colorado river coming up, um, this summer, uh, spending a lot of time in sun Valley in the lakes. Um, and then I'm going to be planning a lot for a sister summit 2.0, which yeah. is, uh, it's the first all woman ski and snowboard backcountry event. Um, we had the first one at Mustang powder this past year. Uh, what sets it apart too is it's all female media team, all female guides. So it was all 40 women at the lodge. Um, and next year we'll be going to Eagle Pass and Engelberg, Switzerland. So it's really exciting. And I'll be doing a lot of fundraising for that and speaking events, just speaking about the power of uh, Sister Summit. It's been Same. really cool. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's super exciting. Well, um, on that note, do you have any thank yous you'd like to share? Um, well, thank you to Backcountry. This is so exciting to like be in the presence of the goat. Yeah, yeah, we're psyched <laughs> to have you on board. Presence of the goat, getting a tour of the whole um, office here today was really exciting. Um, 
big shout out to K2 as well. They've been my longest supporter for 15 years. And um, yeah, my fiance, my family, all of those guys. I mean, couldn't do it without them. And you, I mean, this has been a really great chat. Thanks, yeah. Nils. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. This was awesome. It was really cool to hear your story and kind of get your perspective on your approach to so many cool things that you do. Thank and you. also thank you to everyone who tuned in. Hopefully you liked the episode. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you did. And in the meantime, in the group backcountry, we'll see you out there.